Welcome everybody to the um, sixth of the ESCO COVID-19 webinars uh, in which we are focusing on economic measurement issues arising with the pandemic. And this will be the last of these webinars for the summer, but we hope to pick up the series again in October. And for today, we're delighted to have with us Juan Mateus Garcia to present some very exciting work on measuring the economic impacts of COVID. And Juan is uh, based at Innovation Foundation Nesta, where he is Director of Innovation Mapping. And Juan will present for about 40 minutes and we'll then have 15 to 20 minutes for questions after his talk. If you have a question, then please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen to type. If you are invited to speak, you will need to unmute your microphone and please mention your name and affiliation before asking your question. Uh, I should also mention that this seminar is being recorded and will be made available on our website uh, in, probably tomorrow. Uh, Juan, over to you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and thank you everyone for, for joining us for this presentation. Um, yeah, we're going to be talking about the, um, I guess, how we can use novel data sources and as you'll see, we have quite an interesting mix of data sources to measure the economic impact of uh, COVID-19 in the UK. Mm. Yes, go to the next slide. Um, and, uh, and yeah, this is very much work in progress. As we will see, we have put together quite a complex data pipeline to, to, to measure this. So really looking forward to see what you, what you think about it. And, and just to say that this is work done in collaboration with uh, Alex Bishop. Uh, a principal researcher in data science in, in the innovation mapping team in Nesta. So I guess maybe to uh, summarize what I'm going to be saying throughout, in case I run out of time, I hope that won't be the case. I'm, I'm timing myself, I'm planning to be disciplined. Um, we have uh, created a novel data pipeline to analyze sector and geographical exposure to COVID-19 in the UK. We show that uh, product search data tracks changes in consumer interest in products and services and indirectly demand for industries that uh, could plausibly link, be linked to COVID-19. We find that local economies with larger proportion of the workforce in, in sectors that are negatively exposed to COVID-19 based on, on that analysis tend to have higher claim and count rates, uh, people claiming for unemployment benefits, and also experience faster growth in claim and count rates compared to pre-COVID-19 months, suggesting that our measures of exposure are picking up uh, some is telling us something about the uh, impacts of COVID. And this link is going to be stronger for locations with high shares of employment in sectors that have low diversification options away from COVID-19. So it's not just about being exposed, but whether you're able to adapt in response. And those locations that have less options to adapt, uh, our evidence suggests are suffering uh, greater negative impacts. Um, our semantic analysis of COVID-19 notices in business websites that we also look at show that these uh, notices seem to track the uh, evaluation, it should, it should say evolution of the pandemic and reveals heterogeneity in company responses to it. Um, our results suggest that novel data sources can help improve the evidence base about the economic impacts of COVID-19. Um, Realizing their value will require integration with other data sources, official and business surveys as well. As you will see, we make very substantive use of official sources here. Uh, and also innovation in how this information is disseminated. And actually, one of the things that's going to come up qu quite a lot is that we have quite complex visualizations and graphs. Uh, their complexity reflects the richness and detail of the data. And actually, this kind of thing lives more happily in an interactive format that people can explore. And actually, at some points of the presentation, you're going to see a logo appearing at the bottom. And actually, when you have the presentation, you can click on that logo, and that will take you to an HTML version of the visualization being presented in the slide that offers a bit more interactivity and helps you to get into a bit of the detail. And I will show you what that looks like at specific points of the presentation. So let's get started. Um, so it's like measuring the economic impact of COVID. Uh, I guess uh, we have had obviously a very substantive shock uh, to the uh, economy, both in terms of supply, um, with basically some businesses not being, being able to open, some businesses, not, some workers not being able to go to work. At the same time, we have a shock on, on demand, consumer behaviors change, 
there's less demand for traveling, less demand for uh, social consumption. Uh, on the business side, we have uh, changes in investment and with a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and, and then uh, I guess uh, there's an adaptation to the shock and we have seen changes in scale, some businesses grow uh, or scale back. We have seen a change in the scope, businesses diversify into new activities. We see changes in processes. Obviously, the, the best example of this is remote working uh, and, and things like what we're doing here today. Uh, and then also we are seeing innovation. Um, and ultimately, these things lead to an impact. And the impact has almost like knock-on effects. Again, this is like a, a, a complex process uh, and an iterative process. Um, and uh, I guess some of the questions we've been interested in understanding is what firms, sectors, and places are most exposed to this shock? And this kind of answering this question helps us to inform policies to mitigate. And also how are businesses reacting to this shock? And, and answering this question can help to inform policies to adapt. And uh, we, we need relevant, inclusive, timely, and trusted indicators about these processes. I mean, just to give you an example of, I guess, the kind of thing I'm talking about, this photo here is a coffee shop just around the corner from where I live, small batch. I pick up my coffee there. Obviously, with the uh, arrival of COVID, uh, uh, small batch was closed down. Um, it's still closed down, actually. Uh, but because demand for coffee hasn't changed uh, and uh, um, small batch have strong capabilities, uh, online capabilities, what they have done is start to deliver coffee to people's doors and also created a click and collect system where you actually just store their online, go and pick up your coffee. Uh, and I guess this reflects this idea that sure, there have been shocks, uh, but also there's an adaptation and change and we want to understand both things. Uh, and also so we can get very nice coffee. So, um, okay, so just to say something about other research going on, uh, looking at all of these questions, so there's been a, a big like, boom in, in research around COVID. I put some examples in the annex. This, if you click on this link when you have the presentation, it will take you to the, to the end of the presentation and there's lots of references there and, and links to work, including fantastic work that has been presented in this seminar series. Um, Obviously, there's been work looking at labor market data to measure sectoral exposure to COVID-19. A lot of work actually trying to measure the scope for working from home in different occupations. Those are business panels measuring business adaptation and impacts um, uh, on business. And then also uh, a lot of work using, I guess, big data, things like measuring exposure to COVID, through mentions, in, mentions in earning calls. The fantastic presentations we have seen here from Pavel at Indeed on using online job ads, so from Vasco Carvalho uh, in the last uh, session talking about the use of cons consumer transaction data. Um, so yeah, lots of interesting uh, methods, and I guess we, all of them have their strengths and weaknesses. I guess like the more traditional methods, labor market data, business panels, it's more representative, more comparable. Uh, maybe in some cases it has some lags. Small sample sizes uh, make it harder to maybe say meaningful things about the smaller geographies or sectors. And, and they, they, they in general assume that um, all businesses in a sector are the same, which obviously is problematic if, if inside the sector some businesses have capabilities to innovate. We would be, want to find a way to capture that uh, heterogeneity. Uh, big data, obviously, is great, it's timely, like it's literally, sometimes you can be looking at what happened yesterday, what's happening now. It's very detailed and very rich, but obviously we always have questions about how representative it is, how comparable it is, uh, for example, across sectors, across geographies, and obviously a big challenge around reproducibility, especially where we, you're using either quite um, proprietary data, uh, or also where you're using data that has to be processed in very complex ways. And again, we need to make sure that we're transparent about that and make things reproducible. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of like some of the state of play in terms of research. Uh, what we're going to be doing here is uh, try to answer two questions. Uh, what firms, sectors, and places are most exposed to the COVID-19 shock? What are the diversification options and what are they doing about them? And we are going to be combining web sources with open and official sources to generate indicators of exposure to COVID-19 that are granular, uh, firm sectors and geographies. We're also trying to create something that's timely and so comprehensive and comparable. So I guess try to get some of the virtues of the official data into the mix as well. 
And our starting point is going to be uh, business websites. And this is from Glass, it's a, a company that specializes in collecting this data. Uh, they have uh, 1.8 million websites in the UK collected in June 2020. It's 90% coverage of UK business websites. Um, they obtain this via uh, web domain registries and enrich with uh, machine learning. And basically, uh, this contains information about uh, business descriptions. They have sectors, taxonomies, but it's not like the official taxonomy, like the C codes is uh, their own taxonomy based on a LinkedIn taxonomy. They also have postcodes and they have also like given us the text of the COVID-19 notices in websites for May, June and July. It doesn't have any direct information about, I guess, demand exposure to COVID-19, in the sense that we, the websites don't tell us about consumer demand. And also we don't know anything about employment. We don't know how many people work in these companies. Alas, they, they don't tend to post this kind of information online. Um, and obviously there's potential biases in coverage. Um, and I guess what we have done to validate the glass data is uh, we have compared the sectoral and geographical distribution of activity with, um, with a company's house and also the IDBR, the Interdepartmental Business Registry. And we find a strong correlation, a Pearson coefficient over, uh, over, the, over 0 0.9 in, in both cases. And again, there's a, I click, if you click in this thing here, it would take us to the annex where it, it gets into some more detail about that kind of analysis. Um, and actually, you know, if anyone has questions about that, we can go and have a look in the, in the Q&A. But I guess to say at this point that it, the data seems to be probably representative of sectors and places in, in the UK. Um, so, okay, so for us business, the business website data is only the beginning. I'm just going to show you how much other, how, I guess, how the, the kind of data pipeline we have had to build about this. So I guess like to begin with, obviously, um, we get like very granular descriptions of the many things that businesses do. Uh, but we want to actually be able to say something about official sectors. Uh, and I guess locations. So actually, we have the, 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 um, the glass data is matched with companies' house um, to give us labels that allow us to integrate the web data with official taxonomies. Um, we also analyze the business website descriptions to generate terms, and we use these terms to query Google search trends. And the idea here is to get a sense of what's the consumer interest on the kinds of things that companies are talking about in their websites. Uh, to get a sense of how exposed they are to the shock of COVID because we're going to be analyzing how these things are evolving over time. Um, we also, because the business descriptions in principle don't, are not confined to one business, they are telling us about the many things that a business does that would, could be in multiple sectors. We think that this can tell us something about the, the opportunities for diversification. We're going to take these two things. We're going to combine with data from NOMIS, which is the uh, labor market stats uh, website from ONS. That go, and basically, we're going to be focusing on business register employment survey data to look at employment, but also we, we can use the IDBR. And we use this to generate local estimates of employment in sectors that are exposed to COVID or can diversify away from COVID. And we can also combine this with data on claim and count rates also from NOMIS. Um, and this is going to allow us to measure sectoral and local exposure to COVID-19. We're also going to be measuring sectoral diversification options. And then finally, um, we're also going to be analyzing the COVID-19 notices uh, in order to measure ad adaptation to COVID-19. So as you see, this is a bit of a, a complex pipeline with lots of moving parts. Um, and I guess it's, the thing to say is work in progress. And obviously this is a fantastic opportunity. We have to, to I guess, present this work to you and see what you think about it and get your feedback. So we look, we look forward to that. Um, okay. So just to, I guess, make this a bit more concrete, what does this look like? So, um, Basically, uh, say we start with a business website description like this one here from Blackfriars Scenery, which has unique experience in the area of live events, including awards ceremonies, theater and performance staging, meet a wide range of needs, blah, blah, blah. Basically, uh, this is a description from a company that is in the SIG division, I think it's 91, which is arts and uh, creative activities. And basically what we're gonna do is to aggregate all of the business descriptions uh, for companies in the same uh, two-digit SIG code division. And basically then we're gonna extract from that corpus 
those terms, salient terms that are, uh, tend to be unique to that sector compared to the overall distribution of terms in the corpus. Yeah, some of like the unique words that describe what companies in this sector tend to say on their websites. So we do this for the whole sector. And basically this is a list of the salient terms that come out from the analysis. Um, and basically then we're going to take these terms and, and basically we're going to run them against Google uh, 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 search API, which is basically uh, a ser service that Google uses that we can use to obtain information about search trends for different products. And, and we, we use this focusing on searches in the UK. And I guess uh, this chart here is simply showing like the red line is uh, 11th of March when the WHO announced that I guess uh, COVID-19 was a global pandemic. I guess maybe some observations to make here. Uh, we are focusing on those divisions uh, of the SIG uh, taxonomy where there's more activity in, uh, in the glass data. We are stemming the terms to remove duplicates like um, I guess art and arts, things like that. Um, and we're also querying just the top 15 and, and then like we're going to be removing from the analysis very like terms that have very low search frequency. There's no reason why actually, I don't think Google in some cases doesn't offer like results for terms that have very low levels of search and we remove those from the analysis. Some observations here is that the results are going to be dominated by the most popular subsectors in glass. Um, obviously noise in C codes is going to be a limiting factor when we are looking for the salient terms about other manufacturing activities. It's a very informative kind of like C code. Maybe the, the terms are not going to be super informative. And then I guess there's the challenge that, I mean, as they said in the, in the Princess Bride, I, I, the issue that sometimes uh, words are not going to mean what we think they mean. Like, for example, we, we see that a great example of that here. You know, we see like with, with the arrival of, I guess, the, the pandemic, like theater searches go like droop like really like negative, like decline, like less, much less search, but actually dance is going up. Does this mean that consumers are more interested in uh, dance, uh, going to dance events? No, probably they're more interested in dancing because it's an activity to keep fit. And this is something that we're gonna need to remember when we look at this data. Um, that sometimes uh, this is gonna tell us about changes in home production or uh, interest of consumers in terms uh, which are independent for demand for, or for the products and services of the, of the companies in the sector. Uh, and I guess here it's going to be quite important for us to average, like I guess search trends of, over multiple uh, keywords. And also obviously we advise caution in the interpretation of the findings. This is uh, experimental work. Um, but let's see at, at what comes out from the analysis. Um, so, I mean, and this is just some examples actually, just to show that despite of everything I said, in terms like this highly automated process we are using to extract terms about products and services offered by different divisions seem to be quite plausible. You know, like the kinds of terms that come from a division to do with crop and animal production, the kind of terms coming up from a division to do with manufacture of beverages, a sector that has done very well during COVID-19, um, manufacture of fabricated metal, computer programming, like techie terms, open source, web mobile, mobile apps, human health activities like chiropractic, dental clinics, things like that, sports injuries, or other personal services activities, which goes from funerals to tattoos. These are things that we have extracted automatically from the business descriptions um, uh, in different divisions using this approach that I've described. And then, yeah, we have basically run this against the Google search to look at, at the trends. And then we're actually going to be averaging these trends over sectors to, to see what's going on inside of them. So what are some of the key finds? And, and by the way, uh, I guess, uh, as before, there's a bunch of references I've included here around the different ways in which economists and social scientists have been using Google search data to, uh, to analyze, uh, I guess, consumer, con consumer demand or user interest in various subjects. And, and there are links to all of the papers if you're interested in delving further into this, into this matter. Um, so, okay, some findings. Okay, so this is like the first example of a complex chart. Because uh, um, we have, I think it's like 600, 609 terms, products and services, uh, for which we have trend, trend data. And basically what we have done here is we are looking at whether search trends 
have declined in April or June compared to the situation in February before uh, the pandemic, I guess. Um, and this is where we have seen a negative decline. And this is where we have seen a positive decline. And the squares are um, um, the, 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 the squares are between February and April, I guess, like the deepest, darkest kind of like moments of the of the pandemic. And, and, and I guess uh, the triangles are when we start to move like maybe into like some of the uh, changes and, 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 and reduction in the lockdown. Um, and uh, here I'm actually just to show you. So actually, if you click on that link, you will be able to like then hover over like the different uh, terms to see what these things are about. And we see that a lot of the negative terms are going to be around taxis, physiotherapy, museums, hotels, gyms. I guess like social distancing, um, social consumption activities have experienced like a decline in consumer interest. And then the things that people are into, I, I was thinking it's almost like booze, bikes, um, and bread actually, like that, uh, like there's like flour terms related to baking. Like I guess this is picking up the things that people have been doing or, or getting more interested in uh, during the pandemic. And I guess there's like some interesting things here, like golf clubs. Um, this one is golf clubs. So actually very like negative interest, February, February to April, like April compared to February, which I guess is like when people couldn't go and golf. And then in June, when actually golf club, golf courts open, lots of people looking for golf clubs to be able to do that. So I think like it looks like at least at the level of the products, this is telling us something informative about changes in consumer uh, interest for different products and services. And, uh, so social consumption activities go down, home consumption and production activities go up, and then golf clubs first down, then up. Um, so I'm just checking the time. Uh, then as I said, we can uh, aggregate this into sectors. Um, and basically what this line, H line here is doing is showing um, like a trend for a division inside of a six section, like agriculture, forestry, manufacturing, and so forth. And as before, you know, if you click here, you could be able to look at what each of these lines is. For now, I'm just gonna say in the interest of time that we see decline in real estate, accommodation and food services and transportation. Uh, but here, for example, we see a spike in postal and courier services because people are sending more parcels. Um, and then like things start to pick up a bit, like once the, the, the lockdown, I guess, starts to finish and we move into the current state of affairs. And then we see actually, when you look at some sectors, we see persistent declines, like for example, uh, um, entertainment, arts and entertainment. I think this one is, is like basically the cultural activities. And this one here, but then this one here is a sport. Like you can see like this, um, this one actually comes back, I guess, after the football league becomes, uh, can, can becomes uh, starts again. And then like tra traveling is also a sector that hasn't really experienced like uh, any kind of like, incre like uh, increasing consumer interest in recent um, uh, weeks consistent with the idea that people are still being quite cagey about traveling. Um, I guess it's still like quite a noisy set of series. What, what, so what we have done actually is like before aggregate all of the like search interest uh, for months and normalize. And basically what this is showing here is again, each of these things here is a sector. The square is um, volume of search uh, in uh, April compared to February. And the triangle is volume of search in uh, February, in, in June compared to February. And this is the ones that have experienced negative uh, uh, interest compared to February. And these are the ones that experience positive interest. Uh, and I guess, again, if you click here, you could get like the hover over all these things and get like hover over them and see what they are. But I guess the summary is that transport, accommodation, construction, personal health, creative arts are the sectors that are, I guess, experience negative interest. Gardening and landscaping services, manufacture of food, manufacture of wood, publishing, textiles, and as I said, beverages is the positive interest. And then like some interesting, like I guess, changes here, like say retail of automotives, very negative when we come when we look at the at April. But actually, I guess as the lockdown finishes and people are able to start to drive places and get out, actually much more interest on this. And then an example of a sector that had a lot of interest, I guess, in April, maybe like in the in the most like um, uh, that, like the most challenging times during the lockdown, 
uh, and then like in recent times have maybe seen less interest these activities of membership uh, organizations and actually a lot of this is it tends to do with religions and i guess it's maybe people looking online for information about those activities is something that maybe has become um, of less interest as as we start to come out of the lockdown and things start to look somewhat more positive but yeah, the sum, the sum up industries involved in home production experience more search interest and industries involved in social consumption less search interest. What we have done is basically we have ranked um, companies and sorry sectors into like their position within this distribution. Um, so basically uh, there are um, um, sectors which are in the ranking zero say for example for April they are the ones that are, have experienced most negative uh, interest uh, and then uh, we're going to see the, the ones that have experienced most positive interest and I guess what we're going to be doing in what follows is actually look at um, basically what are the share of employment in different parts of the UK in sectors with different levels of exposure the, 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 sec the, 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 the sectors that are most negatively exposed and the sectors that are most positively exposed and we're going to be focusing the analysis mostly in the April month, but uh, we could reproduce the same thing for uh, June or even July, which uh, I guess is data we haven't collected, but we could use the same pipeline to update the analysis. Um, so let's move into the geography of exposure. As I said, we estimate the share of breast employment in sectors with different levels of exposure. We do this at the TTWA level, um, and obviously this means that uh, we are missing Northern Ireland from, from this analysis because the breast data is not available for Northern Ireland, but we could, we could get like results for Northern Ireland if we, if we use the IDBR. Um, and yeah, I guess like the thing to say here is just to reinforce, we are taking the sectors that we have identified as highly like negatively or positively exposed to COVID-19 based on the pipeline, pipeline I showed you and then combining that with the official data to say something about the share of employment in those sectors in these, in these locations. And actually what we find is uh, a heterogeneity in local economy exposure to COVID-19. Uh, and I guess, you know, it's not like a very super clear picture here, maybe like the sense that maybe some of the more coastal areas are maybe more exposed, but it's not super clear. And basically, this is going to be reflecting uh, the broad-based nature of COVID-19 impacts and the heterogeneity of local economies. And this is much clearer when we look at the situation in different DTWAs. And that's what I'm going to be showing you now. So actually, if we look at, and actually here it's useful to like uh, open like an interactive uh, again. So if we look, this is like the, the, the places which, has, which are, have the sh highest share of employment in sectors that are the most negatively impacted by COVID-19 according to our analysis. So we see a place like Ullapool in Scotland. This is because a lot of activity in accommodation, in education, human health. In Aberystwyth, with it seems to be mostly about a lot of activity in education with their university and so forth. In Bournemouth, again, it's different. It's human health activities, education, financial services. So it's almost like places are exposed to COVID 19 for different reasons, and this depends on their sectoral composition. So it's more they're not a single as, as answer to the question, what explains if a location is exposed to COVID-19? Um, and same thing if we look at places which are positively exposed. So here, again, I'm going to make it interactive. And basically, in this case, we see, for example, Mool and Isle, they are actually have a lot of uh, positive exposure, and this is manufacture of beverages, and these are the distilleries obviously that um, ELA is famous for a lot of activity in that sector that explains why ELA might in some senses be benefiting from COVID also we see lots of activity also like exposed negatively. Uh, in Spalding this seems to be driven about the the, by the manufacture of food products and in Bullis and Tetmonds a lot of, to, of it to do with uh, services uh, to buildings and landscaping activities would be the, the sector that's important in, in bullies and tenements that would uh, be um, more positively exposed to COVID. So, um, and yeah, again, like you can click on the link on your own and you can actually have a play with, um, to see what's the situation in different places. Um, I guess um, one of the things that we obviously we are, you know, interested in is at the end of the day, does this tell us anything about what's happening to the labor market in these locations? 
Um, so almost like as a sanity check, you know, rather than a formal kind of like modeling exercise, we have looked at whether there's a, a, a link between uh, our measures of uh, local exposure to COVID and uh, evidence of COVID outcomes on local economies. And we're going to be looking at claim and count rates under evolution as a proxy for the impact of COVID-19 in local labor markets. Here, I'm, I'm very clear that I'm very aware of recent research that argues that claim counts overstate the impact of COVID-19 on employment. And this is for administrative reasons, like the rollout of the universal credit. And I think the fact that there have been some, might, might have been some delays in the updates of the figures uh, during lockdown. Uh, but, you know, this is one, just one of the few indicators available at our level of geographical resolution, which is TTWAs, and we take it with caution as a proxy for local labor market exposure to COVID-19, whether perceived or realized. And basically, what we have done here is very simple, um, and, and this is something that we want to develop further in, in future analysis, is regress claim and count rates, and also changes in, in share of employment, uh, sorry, and, and uh, uh, and changes in claim and count rates post and pre-COVID on uh, employment shares in sectors which are highly negatively exposed to COVID, also controlling for regions. And this is super simple analysis. And I guess the thing we find is, is that consistent, I, I guess consistent with the idea that um, those places that have higher shares of the employment in sectors more negatively exposed to COVID see uh, more uh, a highest, uh, larger jump in the rates of claimant counts. And I must say that the, when, when I say rates of claimant counts is normalized by the working age population. Uh, and these results are consistent um, when, we, when we, instead of regressing share of employment, we also can re look at share of, of establishments using IDVR. So I guess uh, in terms of a sanity check, I guess this suggests that our measure of um, exposure to COVID-19 is, picking up, is picking, picking up, telling us something about actually whether, whether um, I guess, allocation is gonna suffer from, from uh, the impact of COVID. Um, okay, I guess uh, this moves us to the second part of the presentation, which is everything I've been talking about so far. It's assuming that every company belongs to a single industry. It's a mutually exclusive, completely exhaustive uh, industrial taxonomy. Uh, but actually, the reality is that sectors do, like companies, do different things at the same time. Like this, our kids' brother is just a business description from the data. They produce live and broadcast events, create strategic entertainment focused companies, of brands, uh, agencies, promoters, and cultural institutions. Obviously, they do uh, festivals, uh, concerts, so we're perhaps not going to be doing so well during COVID. Brand activations, I'm not sure about what that means, but. Uh, I guess perhaps less exposed. And I guess what we're interested in here is whether we can use this kind of rich descriptions of businesses to understand opportunities for diverse, diversification. And what we're going to be doing here is basically see if we can label companies with multiple industries to capture these opportunities. So actually for this one, instead of just saying, oh, this is in uh, arts and creative, actually it's also in marketing because that's what our, this, its description suggests. So basically what we do is we treat the class companies house match data set as a label data set uh, where we, the labels are the six sectors and the, and the predictors are the descriptions. And we train a machine learning model that predicts sectors based on those descriptions. Uh, the model, I must say the model that is not amazing in terms of its performance. Um, and this is due to noise in the C codes and also noise in the descriptions. Having said this, um, it includes the actual label uh, uh, that the say, company has in 72% of the times and in the top 10 predictions in 84% of the time. Uh, and if you want to get into some of the detail and some of the sectoral differences in the performance of the model, again, there's a link to the annex where we show some of that. And basically what we have done here is we have a look at, basically we have ended up in a situation where for every company, we have a vector of probabilities that it belongs to sectors. And basically then we have looked at sector co-occurrences in companies and we have built a sector space that is basically telling us what sectors are more similar to each other based on their proximity of this space. And the idea is that those sectors which are closer to each other in this space, it's easier to diversify from one to the other. 
uh, and this is based on, I guess, quite influential uh, no notions of, I guess, uh, distance uh, and economic complexity in the work of people like um, uh, Ricardo Hausmann, Cesar Hidalgo. So this is what the sector space looks like. And the idea here is that, say, in this case, I think 61 is telecommunications, 62 is uh, broadly computer programming, because they are close, it's probably easier for them to move to, a, to another, from one to the other, whether as, whether as if you're a company in this sector and you wanted to get here, actually that's going to be quite challenging uh, in terms of, say, the, the kind of capabilities which are required to do that. And we have color the nodes depending on the level of exposure to COVID. So I guess 55, I think, is accommodation. So you wouldn't want to go there. Um, you might want to go here, which is 98. I don't remember what 98 is. So basically, computer programming can diversify into telecommunications or information service activities. Retailers, which is 47, can move into wholesale. Uh, and maybe in a way, this is what the small batch, which I showed you before, is, is doing in some ways. Um, arts and creative can move into video, 90 to 59. Um, accommodation actually is a bit more limited. It looks like they could only move into real estate, but real estate is also quite negatively impacted by, by exposure to COVID. So maybe like their diversification options are more limited. So basically um, what we have done, again, is think about how do we use this to say something about local economies. So basically what we have done is measure the diversification options for negatively exposed sectors as their mean distance in the sector space to all of the other non-negatively exposed sectors. This is a bit of a, of a mouthful. Basically what this means is we have looked at the mean distance of 55, which is like red is a negatively exposed sector to all of the other sectors which are positively exposed of neut or neutral. And then we have averaged that. And we have done that for all of the sectors which are negatively exposed. Uh, uh, either like in ranking zero, the most negatively exposed one or one. And basically we have found that sectors like accommodation, transport and libraries and museums have lower diversification opportunities than uh, knowledge intensive sectors. And actually when we look at the geography uh, of this situation, I think it's quite interesting because we start to get like see some patterns which are maybe a bit more uh, clear. So I'm now, now opening the maps. These are like the places that uh, with the share of employment in negatively exposed sectors where there are very low diversification options and as we're going to see this is rural places in the coast of scotland um, and actually when you look at the at the locations that have uh, employment in highly expo negatively exposed sectors but that have lots of high diversification options actually this here is oxford this is cambridge Aberystwyth, Swift, we saw that it was exposed for, because of education, but it might be able to diversify into um, other uh, other sectors more easily than, say, some other some other locations. So I guess what this is telling us is that once we start to consider diversification pot potentially in the analysis, the picture of the geography of exposure to COVID changes a bit compared to what we saw before. Um, and then uh, what we have done, again, like in line with what uh, I did before, we have the, again looked at the, basically at the link between claim and count rates um, um, and the share of employment in sectors which are negatively exposed to COVID uh, and have low options for diversification. Um, and again, you know, what we say actually, when you compare the coefficients of this model, which is like a very simple model, uh, I to totally take that is that the coefficients in terms of like the association between uh, the, the growth in claim and counts of allocation uh, 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 and the, the link between those and, and uh, share of employment in sectors with low diversification options is much higher than what we got when we looked at simply looking at share of sectors with, um, uh, with high exposure but without taking into account diversification. And I guess it suggests that those places that were able to diversify actually will suffer less in terms of the impacts of COVID-19 in the labor markets. And, and this result is again uh, robust to changing the measures of activity. So if we look at share of establishments according to the IDBR, also including Northern Ireland, in terms of, in, instead of like share of employment, uh, according to BRES, the results are very similar. So, um, Okay, just to conclude, like uh, um, with the third part of the analysis, 
um, I guess until now, what we have been doing is using, I guess, an interesting way to draw on the glass data, like the business websites, to say something about local economies by combining with them, um, with uh, nomies, like using like the sectoral classification. Here, we are going to go a bit more micro and actually look at the COVID-19 notices. And this is where um, the work is gonna be a bit less uh, developed. It's, it's basically very much work in progress. But just to give you a sense of what we have here, we have 640,000 COVID-19 notices for companies in our data set for May, June, and July. Uh, there are things like this one here. You can read that this is a company saying that we are experiencing agile and remote working and are e equipped to do this effectively. So actually, even though they're shutting down their office, um, this is not going to impact in their service. Here we have like a physiotherapy practice just saying that they have had to close and when they reopen, this is the way things are gonna work. And then I, uh, this is like a random one I found. It's like about a, a video games company that were supposed to host this company of legends thing, but COVID-19 got in the way. So it's a very rich, very interesting kind of like uh, set of like, um, I, I guess, documents about exposure to COVID um, in different companies. Um, and basically, um, how can we analyze all of this data to learn something about sectoral and geographical exposure and team resp firms' responses? And here, just because of time and because the work is less developed, I'm just going to may make a couple of points. Um, um, and yeah, I guess like, the first thing to say um, is that our exploration of sectoral distribution of notices suggests that the sectors we identify as negatively exposed are all overrepresented in terms of notices. But obviously not all notices are the same. Some people are opening, some people are closing, some people are gonna do great according to their, what they say in the website. So actually what we have done is train a topic model on all of this text. Uh, and the idea is to be able to understand in, in a bit better what these notices are about, and then look at uh, the revolution over time and sectoral distribution. Uh, so basically the, the topic model, what it does is it identifies collections of, of topics, collections of words that tend to appear in the same documents. And it also tells us about what topics are more important for different, um, for different documents, for different companies. So for example, topic six, these are the kind of terms in the topic that we are extracting. Uh, it's about lockdown. Topic two is about socially distanced re reopening. And actually we find that topic six uh, was more frequently, appeared most frequently in May, which I guess is when we had lockdown and it's declined in importance. Whereas like topic two on socially distanced opening is becoming more important more recently, I guess, because we are starting to reopen places and so forth. And actually some of these topics are more sector specific and have to do with things like hospitality, with like uh, um, opening of offices and things like that. And we did a lot of work for us to do in terms of analyzing this further. The only other thing I wanted to say about the, um, about the notice data is that actually um, we have found a lot of heterogeneity in the, in the types of things that companies say, uh, even when we look inside of the sectors. In other words, companies in the same industry are saying very different things in their notices about the impact of COVID and how are responding to it. Uh, and actually the sectors that have more diversity in the kinds of things they are saying about COVID are the ones at the top here, and the ones that have less diversity are at the bottom. And we have measured diversity just by calculating uh, this like uh, Shannon entropy index on the topic composition of the topics in the um, in the sectors. And it looks like knowledge intensive companies tend to show more, show more diversity in their topic mixes. And I guess this suggests that maybe they have more options for diversification along the lines of what we saw before. But also like very importantly, what this is showing is a lot of heterogeneity in how companies respond to COVID even inside of sectors. So I guess like it kind of like creates a challenge of, okay, uh, to which extent do we need to go like drill down further into what's going on inside individual companies, as well as talk about the sectoral picture or the geographic local picture, which is what we have been doing until now. And just to illustrate that, you know, we have Ocado, uh, and Primark to companies that I guess have experienced the uh, COVID-19 crisis differently, but both of them are in the same SIG division. So actually they wouldn't appear very different in terms of exposure or impact in our data. So I guess uh, this is the kind of uh, thing we would want to unpick further 
uh, using the kind of microdata that we have uh, collected in this project. So yeah, that's and I guess that leads into, into my conclusions. Um, I guess our analysis has really highlighted the potential of novel data sources to monitor the impact of COVID-19 with uh, more geographical and sectoral granularity and timeliness. Very important to note, this data is a complement rather than a substitute for official data at all stages of our analysis. Um, and thank you, ONS, for making like a lot of that official data available through APIs and in very kind of nicely accessible ways that makes it easy to incorporate into this kind of work. Uh, our findings are consistent with the idea of recovery in consumer interest in most products and services, but not all. They also suggest that the fortune of local economies will hinge on their ability to diversify away from COVID-19 impacted sectors. More complex and knowledge intensive economies may be able to diversify faster. Could this uh, widen regional inequalities in the UK? That's like obviously a, a, a great concern because we know that those regional inequalities are already pretty bad. So anything that's going to make them worse is, is worrying. Uh, and we find evidence of heterogeneity in firm level responses to COVID-19 in sectors and understanding the impacts of COVID-19 will require opening the black box of sectoral geographical aggregates. And I guess for me, like one of the things that come out from this analysis, and maybe this was clearest when I was showing you like those mini dashboards of sectoral, almost like local exposure to COVID based on sectoral composition, is that we need to find ways to make all of this information, rich information available to local stakeholders uh, at the right level of detail and timeliness. Um, and I think that um, a lot of this is going to require us to move into like, how do we create, uh, to turn this kind of information into interactive visualizations, into dashboards, into tools that people can explore to understand what's going on in their location, what's going on in their location and in their sector. Uh, and obviously we can bring like the kind of COVID notice analysis that I mentioned before, that, that would be even better. We think that's going to be super useful in informing the economic building back process that we need to get started. And just very, I mean, just to conclude, I'm already like three minutes over time, uh, just in terms of like the next steps. As I said, this is work in progress. We still need to do lots of things here. But I guess some of the key questions are tuning, tuning our data pipeline and model specification. Obviously, the model I presented to you was quite austere in terms of like the variables that it included. We really need to like uh, enrich this model and also bring into it uh, spatial effects instead of just like assuming that TTWAs are disconnected from each other. It would be nice to go beyond C codes just because they have some limitations. Uh, expand our definition of exposure. I guess like what we seem to be capturing until now in the presentation is more uh, demand shocks. Uh, but what about other measures of exposure like supply shocks? Measuring outcomes, um, obviously it would be nice to um, bring in other uh, indicators that are maybe less, um, raise less issues than claim accounts. And also like very important, it would be great to bring into the analysis firm level uh, data, like uh, either from like micro sources like IDDR, or also like it would be interesting to match this kind of data we have been talking about here with like say the, some of the business panel survey data uh, uh, that's been collected maybe to now cast the COVID-19 impacts. You know, how do changes in the descriptions of what businesses do in websites so their notices, how that, can we combine this with information about what, about what businesses say their expected or experienced impacts are in, uh, in, in, in these surveys, how can we use that to make predictions about what's gonna be happening in the future? And obviously reproducibility and dissemination, um, as I said, make all of this interactive so that people can explore. And then I guess, obviously we cha one challenge we have with reproducibility is that some of the data that I've talked about is, is proprietary, it's like coming from Glass, like a, a private sector company. Uh, but we are very keen to make uh, as much of this code and uh, as much of we have done available so that other people can reproduce, build on it. Uh, so we will be doing that through GitHub and, and watch this space. We'll be sharing that information uh, further down the line as we continue with the work. So yeah, I think that's that's it from me. Um, my That's my email and the email of Alex. If you want to uh, drop, the, drop us a line, if you want to follow up in any way. And yeah, looking forward to see what you think about uh, this work. Thank you. 
Thank you, Juan, uh, very much for, for your talk. Uh, you showed us an in incredible amount of um, information and insight from, from many data sources um, with you know, lots of granularity on patterns and demand shifts and also uh, on how businesses are adapting to the disruption of the pandemic. Um, I, I was wondering, I know you said this is work in progress, but, but I'm hoping you might say a little bit more about it. Um, this is about your work to measure the way that businesses are uh, adapting to COVID. So you talked about how you are extracting business responses from text analysis of their yeah. COVID notices. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I wonder how, and, and you say you're planning to, to compare these to some survey. So for example, I was wondering whether you're planning to compare them with the ONS BIX data, the, the business impact of COVID-19 survey, yeah. Um, or to follow up with firms uh, in, in, a, in a separate survey. I think from a, from a measurement perspective, it would be really interesting to link these data to see how they complement one another or how they can help verify uh, yeah. the, the, the different things you extract from them. Um, the other question I had for you, um, and, and then we'll take some questions from, from the audience, um, was, I wonder, so, so you, you have 1.8 million websites from which to extract these uh, COVID notices. Um, yeah. And I, I'm just wondering whether some firms are more likely to share this type of information than other firms uh, on their website. So do we think that there are any biases arising from the way in which firms report these things and I was just wondering whether you'd done any work on that or had any yeah. thoughts about that. And um, mm. so if, if you can respond to that, then we'll take a question from uh, Tommaso uh, Chiarli after that. Oh, Tommaso, great. Uh, um, okay, so in terms of uh, uh, survey validation, so we are talking with at least one, I, I guess one um, policy stakeholder who are trying to like collect some data through a survey and we're thinking about how to connect it what we're doing here with that, and obviously the challenge is how to do it in a way that's not disclosive for the companies whose survey responses are being matched. I mean, uh, if anyone in the audience has any thoughts on, um, I guess, how we could do this, or like or have access to any other like, like firm survey data that could be matched with what we're doing here, we would be very keen to have those discussions because, yeah, we are very keen to, I guess, as much as possible link these measures of exposure with measures of impact but if, if we can do it that at the firm level then that would be uh very exciting and, and that's what those kinds of services are going to be giving us um i guess in terms of the sectoral differences i, I sorry like the like the biases in in company uh uh i guess publishing of notices um i, I think we have noticed some interesting on like sectoral patterns here. Like for example, as I said in the presentation, uh, most of the um, sectors where we see negative exposure to COVID also tend to be overrepresented in terms of their notices. But there are actually exceptions to this, like um, in the case of um, construction, actually they are underrepresented. And I think like I would really like to dig, dig into that, that further. And that's where actually we might need to do some qualitative field work and engage with some of these companies to understand what is driving them to put up the notices or not put up the notices. So I guess that that's very going to be that, that question of biases, which is obviously super important whenever you're working with, um, with web data uh, and things like this is something that we will definitely be addressing uh, as a follow-up, especially if we, I guess, do more work with, with that component of the glass data, which wasn't like, I guess, the main area of focus in this presentation. Thank, thank you very much, Juan. Um, and now we'll have a question from uh, Tommaso Chiarli, please. Um, thanks, Juan. Uh, fantastic as usual, thank you very much. Um, I actually have three, uh, three questions, am I allowed to, uh, ask my three questions, uh, which are should I stick to one? Please go ahead. Right. Uh, sorry, Rebecca. <laughs> no, I Rebecca. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, the first question uh, was uh, a little bit detailed. One uh, was um, curious about how you treat the Google Trends data. Um, my experience yeah. using these data is that uh, their way of normalizing them is a bit weird um, and not mm -hmm. particularly well documented. Uh, so when you extract this data, um, to me, they, they, it becomes very difficult to compare them with uh, 
data which uh, which are outside uh, Google Trends. Um, so if, I mean, um, it's not a huge thing, but uh, it's something that when you compare with uh, external data might be relevant. So just a yeah. question about how a question about how you did that. The second question was about um, your results uh, from the sectors and um, um, well, the different goods and services. And uh, as you mentioned, some of the word may not mean uh, what we think it might mean. And in particular, I was wondering whether you may improve the search, um, uh, this again on, uh, on Google Trends, by adding operators to the keywords that you already have, uh -huh. uh, which are related to the type of consumption. So you made this mm -hmm. example, for example, of the coffee at home. Um, so it's very yeah. difficult different for a company if they can uh, move their, well, shift their business, not to another business, as you clearly described, but the same yeah. business, but with a very different delivery. Um, yeah, yeah. You've probably done as well. I mean, you, you can buy fish from, from the fish market uh, in, in Hope Lagoon now, uh, yeah. which you couldn't do before. And um, we could ask them, but I don't know how much their, their business went down. Yeah. Uh, so it might be that, you know, people might be looking for sports, but sports open air, sports like doing yoga at home, uh, yeah. they might be looking, so I don't know if adding those keywords may, may actually yeah. reduce some of the noise that you that you find. Yeah. And uh, the third question um, is about the um, special results, um, which, uh, which, which I find extremely interesting, particularly when you combine with the diversification. Um, yeah. <clears throat> my concern there is whether this uh, uh, shows the actual shock um, and, and this is probably uh, also shown in, uh, in your correlations, uh, which, uh, which are positive, but quite, uh, quite small. Um, and I would have two, at least two uh, important reasons why you may not capture the real shock at the local level. Uh, the first one uh, is again about this shift uh, uh, to potentially delivering online goods and services. Um, and this may be, as you say, firm related, um, may also be to some extent sector uh, related. And the second mm -hmm. one, which is probably more important and also more easy to track, is the indirect relations between sectors. Um, now, I think uh, you do a great job in looking at the uh, potential firms to move across the product space horizontally. But the impact that um, the demand has on one firm does not stop there. Uh, it actually has uh, an impact on on all firms um, that that source uh, that firm that receives an impact. Um, so a theater might be demanding uh, less food uh, and and less furniture. Yeah. Um, so I guess whether adding uh, vertical, uh, I mean, this is something on which we are working. So sorry, it's a bit biased this question. Adding vertical relations might might provide uh, a, a, a more um, uh, precise understanding of the of the shocks um those are fantastic questions thanks so much tomaso and it's great I, it's great to hear your voice it's been too long um <laughs> I, I think like um i mean so uh i'm just going to answer you quite quickly but i think it would be great to catch up separately about all of this and also learn about what you're doing so i guess like in terms of like the google search completely take your point actually the concerns about about it is why we aggregate quite crudely, com, you know, ag aggregate over months and compare months in terms to, instead of trying to do anything more granular, uh, average over categories for for different categories. And also, like one thing we do is actually we don't take into account the volume of uh, activity in every single category. We don't normalize by that. Uh, we don't wait because. You know, again, we don't know what that means exactly. So we're being quite crude in terms of how we work with it, um, just to, I guess, um, not compound the complexity uh, of of the analysis. But yeah, I mean, in terms of like what you said about combining, like some some sort of like way to combine terms to generate more nuanced kind of like results back, that would be great. I guess what we have been doing until now is quite automated, like in terms of just generating the terms out and then querying would be actually one of the things we could do going forward is maybe include, include like an element of human validation of the terms and maybe think a bit more about um, combinations of terms. And I don't know if there is where 
another Google product like Google Correlate is something we could use to almost like create those combinations. I guess maybe my caveat would be that uh, in doing that, probably we're going to get into like lower volumes of search beyond what Google search trends would giving us back in terms of results. So I guess this is where, I guess it's like a trade off between granularity and, and, and coverage. And obviously, you know, it would be great to, maybe, uh, to, to see what Google think about this because they have like the raw data and whether maybe they could generate better estimates of demand for different terms and combinations of terms um, along the lines of what they have been doing with mobility and things like that. Um, I guess uh, the, what was the other point? Uh, the, 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 those fantastic points. I guess, I guess like maybe I'm just gonna focus on the last one because we're gonna be following up anyway. But the, the one on input output tables, like, and I guess like the idea of like almost like indirect shocks in an economy as a negatively exposed sector, maybe reduces its, like employees in that sector reduce their uh, demand for pro products and services supplied by other local sectors that are not negatively exposed. And I guess in a way, our measure of claim and counts has is being quite agnostic towards that. Like actually we are not understand not, we're not being able to capture where do the employment claims come from in terms of sectors. So in principle, we might be able to pick up some of those indirect effects in local economies. Uh, but it would be great to actually get, get something a bit more refined to be to be able to look at this. And that's where the kind of micro firm, like micro analysis would be great. I mean, one thing that I had been thinking about as an as an extension was to actually create almost like you see input output tables or something to look at sectors that are maybe not, not directly negatively exposed to COVID based on the kind of analysis we have done, but indirectly negatively exposed. Maybe some of that's already picked up by our sector space, but it would be great to like think a bit further about how to do that in order to um, get into, I guess, pick up better like the complexity of the impact of COVID-19 in local economies. And, but as I said, you know, all of this to continue, looking forward to continue discussing with you and also learning about what you're doing. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Juan and Tommaso. Um, so we're gonna take a question from Charlotte Meng and then from James Phipps. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let us run a little over time. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, first of all, very impressive uh, research. Um, you've um, done a lot during the past months. I'm, um, yeah, very interested in uh, um, the diversification options for firms and the uh, industry space you created. Yeah. Um, just wondering if you have checked whether um, linked firms are equally affected by COVID because, um, for example, if one industry has several options in the map, but they are like closely related firms are also affected heavily by COVID, that basically means um, they have the options, but these options are not actually useful when they are coping with the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's question one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the second question is um, about um, the Google search terms. One of the observations you mentioned is um, the issue. I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> I wonder how you cope with this because it seems to me a very important step to make sure that the final results are really valid and uh, yeah. reliable. So yeah, yeah, if you can say more about that. So, I mean, on the first one, in a way, like our measure of like mean distance to safety is trying to pick up that idea that, for example, as I said before, you know, accommodate. I, I guess um, accommodation could move to um, real estate, but that's not great because real estate is not great either. Yeah. So I guess by almost like looking all of the paths from at the at current situation to to safety and, and and seeing like what's the mean distance to safe sectors is trying to pick up this idea that you might be just in a really bad part of the network and, and all of their options are kind of kind of bad so we're trying to uh, pick up um on that idea i guess one thing that we don't do is to consider i guess like the weight of the of the connections because actually this this network is weighted you know and again we could use that 
to maybe like get a, get a more nuanced sense of like the diversification options and 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 how they are like um, how companies can pursue them. Um, in terms of like the, the other question, I mean, that's like so tough. Like because actually, the example I showed you, you know, this is literally coming from just generating this example and thinking, okay, this is like a different pattern from everything else. What is going on there? You know, and and I'm thinking, okay, actually, this is what explains this. Um, but I think like with the current automated pipeline that we're using, it's likely that we're gonna have more kind of like terms like that. Um, and actually, the, the 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 task of removing, identifying those terms and removing them, it would keep bring a lot of subjectivity into the analysis as well. Uh, or would require a lot of domain knowledge, almost like from, almost like ethnographers of COVID who understand how the behavior of like the population has changed in response to it. So I think at this point we are, you know, and in the spirit of like almost like building like a prototype of the pipe, the whole pipeline and seeing what was working, we are adopting the very crude kind of approach of generating many different terms and averaging over them. I think like maybe something we could do going forward, going beyond like human validation, which is something that we will do and, and we are very keen to do, to think about whether say we seen a sector can we find almost like outlier kind of categories that experience mm -hmm. different patterns from everything else and see whether those outliers are explained by heterogeneity inside of the sector or are they explained by the thing we are discussing the fact that actually the term doesn't on its own just capture demand for products and services but it's capturing other things as well so uh, it's one thing i'll say is that in terms of maybe to conclude this point is that in terms of actually the the, the 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 Google data we have collected is I mean is open data I guess in so far you get it from like their API and this is something we'll be sharing with all of the categories all of the like um, the divisions they belong to like the like the index of interest based on Google so actually maybe we can crowdsource a bit that that exercise of validation and people who have thoughts on what should go in what should go out maybe. That can be a bit of a conversation started with them. But yeah, thanks so much for your uh, great questions. A lot of work for us to do to, to address them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, if we can take the next couple of questions a little bit quickly, because we are over time. So we have a question from James Phipps uh, and then from David Nguyen. So hi there, everybody. Um, Cheers, Juan, for a great presentation. Um, I just wonder whether there's a way to look at what the skills and capabilities are of the businesses to change and cope as well as, so kind of a focus on how they might respond as well as what they're doing uh, as, in, uh, as a business. Um, for example, whether websites have already got the ability to take online purchases that would allow them to kind of respond uh, more effectively when that, when that need requires. Mm, I mean, hmm. So then I want, uh, thanks, James. Uh, again, it's great to hear from you. Uh, um, so I guess, I mean, one thing that, for example, the glass data has, and we haven't used in this analysis, just because it already had too many dimensions, as you have seen, is they have some information about like uh, e-commerce kind of like the technologies in a website. So in principle, and I should have mentioned that before because it's quite relevant for understanding some of these things. I guess maybe that we, we need to clarify and maybe like in line with the question that Rebecca made about the notices, how representative is that data, you know, and what is it picking up and what is it missing? Uh, so I think like actually that would maybe help us to understand a bit better, almost like what firm level factors condition their abilities to diversify in different ways. And actually this point also connects with like a question from uh, Tommaso before. In, th in terms of skills and capabilities, yeah, I mean, in, term, in principle we could create a sector map based on skills like literally what sectors are connected based on the skills or occupations they share. And again, you know, that tells us something about opportunities for diversification, not based on what businesses do, but based on what they can do based on the people they hire. I think that would be super interesting. I mean, ultimately, like, the, like in the team, we're really excited about this idea of the exit space, which is like sector spaces like that are connected with each other like I'm looking at research, technology, skills, sectors, and see how almost like companies move between this, uh, this very complex space, because that's really what we need to have to understand really like the dynamics of diversification. But uh, yeah, that's definitely 
kind of the, the kind of sci-fi analysis we are thinking about for further down the line. But um, yeah, it would be great to bring that into the mix as well. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, a last question from David Nguyen. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Juan, for this really interesting uh, uh, presentation showing your very interesting work. Uh, as Charles would say, I think you've been very busy the last few months. Um, I have a quick question about the um, substitutability between uh, different goods and services. So I think you have such rich data based on, on what you've compiled. And I wonder whether you can say anything about, you know, the substitutable between online, offline goods and, and and whether we can uh, basically whether this tells us anything about uh, paid versus unpaid activity, as we know that some of the online activity might not actually be be paid for at the point of use. Um, that that's my main question. Uh, I have a few comments, but I'll send you an email. Very interesting. So it's somewhat like the, this is going back to the dance kind of like search term. The fact that you know obviously like uh, people going to like say like dance performances are are paying people dancing in their in their. Uh, lounges maybe not so much hmm I think it would be very interesting to think about how to do that oh, off the top of my head I can come up with like a like a very like smart answer uh, it's not a, my area of expertise but this is like the kind of thing that I would love to discuss with you uh, offline maybe yeah absolutely happy to do that Thanks, David. Thanks. looking forward to uh, follow up <laughs> okay great Okay, um, well, I think our time is up. We've overrun a bit. Uh, thank you, Juan, very much from all of us uh, for, for this excellent work and uh, very much looking forward to seeing how this develops. Um, also, thanks to everybody for questions and participating. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is the last of the ESCO COVID-19 webinars for the summer, but we'll get going again in October with, with some new presentations. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you will join us for the ESCO Conference on Economic Measurement, which will be held 16th to the 18th of September. Um, and it's being held online. And I think registration will be opening next week. Uh, so thanks again, Juan, and have a good summer. Thank you, Rebecca. And as I said, thank you for inviting us. I think it really created incentives to get cracking with the work. So I don't think it would have happened without you, like at least within these timelines. <laughs> thanks so much. And thanks to everyone for the great questions.